Well, it's a privilege for me to introduce uh, Dr. Shelley Earp. Um, uh, I am uh, privileged and fortunate to work at the best comprehensive cancer center in America. Sorry, Amy and Rich. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm privileged to work uh, at this great cancer center, uh, mainly through Dr. Earp. So Dr. Earp has been our cancer center director for many moons. He uh, states that he's probably written more cancer center grants than any acting uh, cancer center director, and I suspect it's true. And not only that, they've been extremely well funded. Uh, and in addition to all his administrative and other talent, he is an outstanding scientist uh, with major interest in epidermal growth factor receptor research. HER4, which is coming into the forefront in many cancers as a potential target, on many other things. He's a great friend. Uh, he takes great care of us all. Uh, and he's going to try to show us the impact of genomic and signaling research uh, and its impact now on clinical research. So we're thrilled to have you, Shelley, to spend this Sunday morning with us. Thank you. You know, there's one really important, that was a great session. Um, but I don't think Nirma went far enough when, the, when that recommendation is it needs to be done at a place that, can, that is exactly like the NSLT. Uh, I'm really afraid that we're going to have, you know, doc in the boxes pop up all over and surgeons that are not of the quality that we're talking about doing these things. This is a, a real potential disaster waiting to happen. Um, I only have one conflict. And that is, I love our faculty. Not so keen on our defense, uh, but I love our faculty. Uh, my one bragging slide, uh, you've seen that we really cover the waterfront. Uh, yeah, three guidelines group with Paul, Ethan, uh, and, um, and Russ Harris, really across uh, uh, the, the whole population sciences. Uh, we have members of the National Academy we publish in high-impact journals, and I think anybody who's been here for the last two days really understands the quality of the, uh, of the clinical and translational faculty. Uh, it uh, w brings us all together from this great campus. Uh, we, we, we were very lucky uh, with uh, Rich's startup package. He actually had a, a $200 million startup package when he came here, the cancer hospital. He left us for $1.2 billion. I just don't understand that. <laughs> training, and our statewide mission. So this is what I, I want to talk about today. Um, I want to make a couple of, of thoughts. At, and, and I think one of the things you'll see is I love our faculty so much I've stolen some of their slides or vice versa. Um, but the fact is that we are reaching an asymptote with our cancer care. Uh, we've done a great job uh, of uh, moving the needle in so many ways over the past, um, you know, 30 to 40 years. But we really have come up a against a group of cancers that are hard to detect early, or we don't do a good job of it, and they are very difficult to treat once they have gotten behind, uh, uh, beyond the capsule. Uh, and so we're going to need to do something different if we're going to take cure rates from 66 to 70 percent to 85 percent over the next period of time. Targeted therapies have changed the course of this already. You'll see, you've seen fantastic, uh, you know, you're literally miraculous fading away of lung cancers, but it hasn't changed the uh, outcome because of resistance developing. So we're going to need to figure out what are the inherent vulnerabilities. Now, keep coming back to this. Cancer cells are different from normal cells, but they do so at a cost. And if we can figure out how they're vulnerable and hit those vulnerabilities, particularly if we can do it up front, uh, we're going to be more successful. So we need to understand this better, uh, and we need to have much better ways of predicting what's going to work in clinical trials. Clinical trials are too expensive. They're too patient intensive. So I'm going to talk a little bit as we go on about preclinical models. You've heard some of this. Uh, this is a real key to moving forward, genomics, and the development of new drugs to new targets. Now, 
These are uh, two papers that were published a decade apart by, by Doug Hanahan and Bob Weinberg that started to try to define what the difference is in a generic way of cancer cells. Um, the importance of, uh, you know, the initial one was to try to catalog six things that cancers do different, not just cancer cells, but cancers. And then a decade later, they, and uh, actually another great article by Steve Elledge, started to, divine, uh, to, to define some uh, emerging hallmarks, which uh, also got to the, uh, the vulnerabilities of how cancer cells change their energetics. They change their ability to, to repair DNA. They change their uh, proteotoxicity. They, they actually create vulnerabilities as they go along. Uh, and we are learning much, much more about the immune system, how they avoid the immune system, and how actually they almost gather uh, goodies f from the perverted inflammatory process. So these are the things that we really need to understand if we're going to move forward. Uh, you know, this is the obligatory signaling circuit slide. You don't need to understand this, because one of the points I'm going to make is Genomics are going to find multiple uh, mutations. You saw those yesterday in, um, in melanoma. You saw them from Chuck's talk. But those multiple mutations actually tend to funnel down to some of these basic processes. So you can mutate in various ways, but we need to understand where the bottom of the funnel is so we can attack those vulnerabilities. Uh, and here are the points of vulnerabilities, going back to, to, to Hanahan. Uh, these are the kinds of drugs that we can use. Uh, the second part of Ned's talk that he didn't get to uh, was how to use INC4 inhibitors uh, uh, um, effectively. Uh, there's a whole set of new companies about uh, attacking uh, uh, glycolysis. The road to avoiding apoptosis is extremely important. So these are the kinds of things that we need to understand. Now. Targeted therapies have been incredibly effective, and actually this one probably has prevented death. It probably has changed the outcome. Many of our targeted therapies really are changing the course of cancer, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a woman uh, with uh, stage 3 ovarian cancer you know, living for eight years rather than three years. That's, that's a tremendous triumph, and we shouldn't ever forget that. But if we're going after cures, we, we need to do something even better. This is the Herceptin story. Her2 is the poster child. It's a great accomplishment. This is putting it up front after years of using it in metastatic disease and then using it in the adjuvant setting, and it really is saving maybe 8,000 lives a year. But 17 years, which is what it took, to the initial is too long to wait. Now, what's great about translational science now, and we really need to st step back and, uh, and take a bow. You heard a lot of it yesterday. But now it doesn't take 17 years. The EML ALK story, the EGF receptor story, which you all know well, uh, really played out over a period of three years from understanding a molecular mutation to having a drug uh, in, in a selected group of people and really changing it. So this is one that, that was found. Uh, here's fish that's showing you that EML and ALK are coming together. They're on different chromosomes. They shouldn't be together. If you take away the, you know, the front part of ALK, now you activate it. You send all those signals down. You cause proliferation. You cause anti-apoptosis. Uh, and you can detect this by sequencing, you can detect it by fish, you can see it by immunofluorescence. But luckily, at this point in time, we were developing a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that happened to fit beautifully in, into ALK. And this is the waterfall plot showing you know, a tremendous activity in a very um, selected group of patients, maybe 2 to, two to 5 percent of people with adenos. But look at this disappearance of lung cancer. That just didn't happen, and it has happened now with EGF receptor mutations uh, and, and ALK. But the problem is, is the cancer in this sense is smarter than we are, and it either selects or develops these mutations, which now means that the crizotinib can't fit in. With the EGF receptor story, we're moving very quickly. We found a set of 
uh, inhibitors which which will melt the cancers away you get resistance and now second generation um, drugs are coming up just like they did, like they did in CML so can the medicinal chemist stay in front of selection of mutations that's one thing uh, and that's one thing we want to do but there are other mechanisms of resistance you can start to turn on these alternatives the EGF receptor HER3, two of my favorite molecules, are called in, in, into play now. So EML ALK is, uh, can talk to them in, uh, in this situation. So we need to understand, uh, i.e., we need to have consistent genomic data as, as we go through this. But the story is probably also we need to move things up front so that we can really hit the tumor hard, like we did with Herceptin prior to the development of resistance. And that's something that we really will talk about in a minute. Now, there's a worse story out there. You heard a little bit about this, that some tumors present with remarkable heterogeneity from the get-go. And this is a startling picture um, in a New England Journal paper from the Sanger Center looking at a very large renal cancer, which has different pathologies in different parts of the tumor. But worse than that, it actually has an evolution in the, in the solid tumor so that you see at least 10 different genomic signatures within the presenting cancer and several different uh, in the metastatic cancer. That's going to be difficult to hit hard up front, but that's unusual. That's, that's not the normal case. And so we can't get discouraged. A lot of, of uh, I think the stock market went down the day after this publication came out because they, they said, oh, my God, targeted therapies are over. That's not true. Okay. Science has to come to the rescue. This is the only way we're going to event. Oh, go. And I'm going to tell you three quick stories about things that are going on here. The kino, which you heard a little bit about yesterday using preclinical models which are more faithful to tumors, and then our attempts to uh, catalog the genome in a, in a much larger way. Now, the kinome, there are 518 kinases in the human uh, genome. We need to know what kinases are expressed in cells and in tumors. You heard Jen Jen talk yesterday about starting to analyze in pancreatic cancers, what kinases were turned on. And it isn't just one, and they aren't just mutated. Somehow, they get turned on by the neoplastic process. What are the different uh, kind of profiles? And then what happens when you use an inhibitor? And this is the great work of Gary Johnson, Stephen Fry, Jen Jen, and a whole host of people that uh, you'll, you'll hear about over time. Uh, and Gary wanted to attack the breast cancer kinome. Uh, he looked at this, and he took four different cell lines, which represent the different subtypes of cancer, used our next generation sequencing capacity, and was able to sequence 423 of the 518 kinases. So this is, they're all being expressed, by and large, the questions of which are active. And that's the brilliance of what Gary and, and, and our MedChem people have done. He's created a column that you can pour a cell line, a mouse tumor, or a human tumor over, and it will capture about half of the active kinome at the same time. And the interesting thing about it is it doesn't necessarily capture the kinome, the kinases, the individual kinases, by the, their abundance, it captures them by their activity because kinases open up and bind to these beads when they're active. You can show that by, by simply adding EGF to a cell and seeing 30 kinases change five minutes later. That's not changing abundance, it's changing activity. So this gives us a remarkable systems look at what's going on. And you can compare it uh, to what's sequenced, and you can get about 160 to 180 of the kinases at one time of the 400 that are being expressed. It's not everything, but it's about a hundredfold better than anything else that's ever been done. So it's a remarkable new technique. And 
Gary and his group want to look at what happened when you used a MEK inhibitor. We're entering this, uh, the phase where we want to inhibit MEK. Remember, RASRAF MEK is, is uh, deranged in almost all cancers in one way or another. Well, if you add a MEK inhibitor, yes, you inhibited MEK, but you turned on a bunch of different kinases. The mechanism's complicated. It has uh, to do with changes in transcription. RNA, changes in ligands. But remarkably, within as little as 24 to 48 hours, you're starting to increase the drive through the process and overcome because you have, have created resistance by increasing re receptor tyrosine kinases. Here's a blow up there. These are the kinases that were turned on after you inhibited MEK. And it turns out when you look at these, you can take a guess. And serafinib hits almost every one of these kinases. And so if you do a dose response curve with a MEK inhibitor and serafinib, you can treat this tumor cell. Better still, you can treat a mouse with a real basal breast cancer using the combination of MEK inhibitor and serafinib. This is something that no one would have guessed without this kind of technology and, and movement. Uh, here's the tumor actually going into apoptosis with, within three or four days of being treated with AZD and serafinib. This is a mouse model, and we'll come back to that in a second. But uh, this has led to now active clinical trials that Lisa Carey and Keith Amos are, 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 are working on. We are biopsying patients with triple negative breast cancer, doing the kinome, we're freezing the sample, and then treating with uh, GlaxoSmithKline MEK inhibitor for seven days uh, in a window trial, and then operating and taking out the cancer. Uh, and we are now up to four patients uh, in this, and this is the first. We have another trial that will be starting with HER2 inhibitors. This is a way of testing in humans as we've tested in cell lines and in mice to see whether we can really define the mechanisms of resistance in a short-term way. Now, let me talk a little bit about using mouse models because I think this is an incredibly important thing. As I said, it takes too long and it's too expensive to do clinical trials of every uh, targeted kinase inhibitor of every targeted therapy, particularly when you can and should start combining them with chemotherapy. What's the schedule? What's the dose? All of those things would take hundreds of patients. We need to be able to do it in mice. And are they, are they a good surrogate? And uh, Ned and Chuck, David Dar, Jerry Ussery, who you saw yesterday, got together and started a major program whereby we're, we're committing 3,000 mouse cages, and that's about uh, uh, 10,000 mice at a time, with a, uh, with a full complement of small animal imaging, Bill Zamboni doing pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. We have the Office of Technology. Uh, we have the medicinal chemists that are making the targeted agents. We're putting them in chow. We can deliver them orally. We can do large-scale clinical trials in mice that have real tumors. These are genetically engineered mouse models. They aren't uh, human cells on the back uh, of a mouse. These have infiltrate. They, they have the immune system. They have everything that a human tumor does. I don't want to stand and tell you that they, these will be perfect surrogates of every disease but they are great surrogates of some diseases. And we can find that out by doing mutational analysis, by looking at arrays, by looking at proteomics, and we're doing all of that. Uh, already 26 publications, 17 grants uh, using this technique. Now, this is you know, basically what's done. They keep the, the, the clear-cut winner mouse models that look in uh, and mimic human tumors, we have a lot of them. We keep breeding them. And then you can start with the biologic inhibitors, the chemotherapy. You can uh, put the animals to sleep. You can do imaging of various kinds, and you can follow these tumors. 
And there's a lot of this published, but I pulled just two things out because they, they just, uh, they're, so, they're so important. Uh, the, the one that really, oh, I'm going to go back here. The one that uh, uh, just has always blown me away, this is a basal-like breast cancer. It's there, it, it kills these mice, and if you give it carbotaxol, which is what you would give people, half of the mice do well and half of the mice don't do well. This is the same tumor driven by the same transgene at the same time in every mouse, and every mouse is related. So there's no genetic difference. There's no inciting difference. There's no environmental difference. And yet, when you give carbotax, you end up seeing the same thing you do in humans. The amazing thing is now we can start to look at what happened in these tumors genetically and what happened in these. Why didn't it work? Maybe we can start defining those things which occur during chemotherapy that give us resistance. Her two new tumors, the patent that works very well. You can't use Herceptin in this because this is a mouse tumor, uh, but, but we're working on ways to do that. Uh, same thing with um, basal-like tumors. We, we, we know that the EGF receptor is important. You give her erlotinib, half respond, half don't. You can take these lapatinib mice and keep them going, and after several months, some of them will start to escape and become resistant. That's what happens in humans. It's much easier to biopsy these. The interventional radiology costs are much lower. <laughs> and not that I don't think Matt's a great doc. Uh, Jen Jen introduced you to another way of doing this, which is really exciting, the patient-derived xenograph. Actually taking the tumor out of the patient, orthotopically putting it in an immune-compromised mouse. Now, you've got a problem there. You don't have the immune system anymore. But you do have the human uh, cells, and in fact, you have, as, as she showed you yesterday, the histology preserved over four or five passages. And she's done a lot of work to show that the genomics are preserved. So this is going to be potentially very good for some tumors. She has, I think, 45 different patients, uh, and um, she has 20 uh, colon cancers, and I know, Amy, that uh, David C. over uh, over Duke is, is doing this with colon cancer, too. So another promising way, again, this is not inexpensive, but it's a whole lot cheaper than clinical trials. We're making new cancer drugs. Uh, this is one of our strategic planned areas where people have said, how could you at UNC be so arrogant as to think that you might be able to do something when pharma is spending $30 billion a year and they can't do it? Well. Maybe we're arrogant, but we think we can concentrate, we can put uh, very smart people, and if you have medicinal chemistry, which is the key, and most places uh, in academia don't have it, but Stephen Fry and Jen Jen and uh, Xiaodan Wang and a number of people have come in, we're able to concentrate on some diseases that are orphan diseases or some targets that other people aren't looking at. Uh, Stephen's been very good at getting NCI money. NCI is a partner in three of our projects. I'm going there tomorrow to, uh, to meet with Stephen and our colleagues on the MER inhibitor. Uh, the ROAR 2 inhibitors are Kim's project. IDH1 inhibitors for brain tumor are UE's. Jen uh, and Stephen are working in the fascinating area of epigenetic modulators, which we think are great targets. So medicinal chemistry leading to preclinical trials in mice, going on to trying to figure out what the next phase of clinical trials should be. Now, the key to a lot of this is really understanding the human condition. Next generation sequencing has been a remarkable technical advance. Uh, uh, and I'll brag a little bit. Uh, we're really good at this. Uh, it's not all Chuck and Katie. But this week it was all Chuck and Katie because Chuck wore a tie. Uh, <laughs> it's apparently, being on CBCS News is the only thing that can, actually can motivate Chuck to wear a tie and a white lab coat. Uh, Katie, as he told you, has uh, done a remarkable job of the bioinformatics. 
we were on the front page of the New York Times. We didn't make the front page of the News and Observer. I don't quite understand that, but um, uh, this is something that we do really well. We've done more RNA sequencing probably than anybody in the world. Uh, but it's because of these machines. Uh, this is uh, kind of w way beyond Moore's law. This is the decrease in signaling. Um, you know, it took, 10, uh, it took 10 years and $3 billion to do two genomes in the 1990s. And now you can do that probably, well, you can do it in, in less than a week, depending on what you do. Uh, we are running high seeks. Um, we have just started to run the MySeq, and there's some practical reasons for doing that. So we can take a patient and do what we want to do in, in a day. We're not doing that routinely yet, but you can actually turn over the sequencing data. That's not the pathology, that's not the validation, but you can do this remarkably quickly, and we intend to be able to do it in, in real time. And there are machines out there that are really science fiction. Uh, we'll see how they fit in. So we started the protocol uh, LCC 1108. Um, we've trademarked UNSeq. Um, and uh, we want, really want to use genetics in a much more robust way. And there are um, groups that are doing uh, uh, so Mass General and Dana Farber are using what's called sequinome, and they are able to analyze the mutations in about 20 to 30 genes. WashU and Baylor and the Broad and others are doing whole genome sequencing, and they can look at every single um, base pair in a tumor. We've devised something that we think is in the middle, we think is practical, and we think we can do in 1,000 patients a year eventually. And if you can do this in 1,000 patients a year and put them in a database and follow them, you're going to have a remarkable archive which will help us understand this in the real world. So we have an IRB-approved informed consent protocol. The patient knows they are participating in a research project. They're going to get 250 cancer-causing genes sequenced at the highest level. They're going to be put in the database, and they're going to be followed, and they're going to help others that follow them. So that's the altruism that so many of our patients have. The difference is that a portion of these 250 genes may be clinically applicable now, and that portion will obviously rise over the next two to three years. And so they are saying, in informed consent, if you define something as clinically applicable and you can validate it in a CLIA-approved way, then yes, I would like you to give me that information and my doctor that information. So this is a, a way of having uh, the research protocol and the potential at any time things are clinically applicable. We're sequencing 250 genes. You have to do the tumor and the germ line. The current time to actually doing the sequencing and, um, and then turning it over to our molecular pathology oncologist committee and then getting it out to the chart is about two months now. Uh, we have plans and hope to be able to do this in about three weeks, particularly with selected patients. There are going to be patients that you do that you're going to give standard of care, and you don't need to have that information now, but you might love to have it when they recur. There are going to be patients that you'd like to have it next week, uh, and so we're going to try to do that. The true cost of this, of just of doing the DNA uh, and, and doing the sequencing and setting up this it's probably $1,000 a patient. What would be charged for this, that's the true cost. What would be charged would obviously be more than that. But if you think about it, this kind of information may replace most pathology and laboratory tests that we do. So if this turns out to be $3,000 or $4,000, it's still going to probably be much more cost effective than all of the reactions that we do and all of the tests that we do. And eventually, we'll have even more. The 250 gene list is being updated, but it basically includes anything that's been implicated in human cancer. 
uh, would detect all, uh, all clinically applicable cancer-causing genes and many that haven't been shown to be particularly in epigenetic areas. Uh, we have groups that are meeting, disease-specific groups that are meeting every three months. This is a very intense faculty-driven process. So each of our disease groups are defining what's clinically applicable with the pathologist. Anything that we find before it's being reported has to be validated in a CLIA-approved assay. We really hope within a year that the sequencing will be CLIA-approved, and we think we, we can get that done. But that's crucial because then you could save, you can save money. Right now it's more expensive because you're validating everything. All patients, and this is the key, will be followed uh, because the applicability may change when they recur several years from now. So they'll be in a database, we'll be following them, and we will see whether this information will change things. The major issues are accessing metastatic lesions. Those are uh, in your phase one program. Those are the patients you actually would like to do the most. Um, and as somebody mentioned yesterday, a lot of the clinically applicable genes that we just are absolutely sure are clinically applicable, we don't have the drugs for now because they are in clinical trials. Uh, everyone who's doing this is grappling with this. How can we get PI3 kinase inhibitors? How can we get an ALK inhibitor for the rare patient that we find in, uh, in EML ALK in pancreatic cancer? How can we get the drug companies to be involved in a, a very large, but for them risky, uh, project? So these are things that we are grappling with, and that's what's exciting about this process for us. Uh, that our faculty are, are uh, in, uh, in, in the forefront, not of the technology. The technology is actually um, getting, it's not rote, but, but it's doable. The bioinformatics is still certainly a, re a research intense, but it's the ethical, practical, legal, and moral aspects of this which are so important. If we can pull this off, and we will, as as well uh, as well, uh, a number of other places that you've heard about, the key thing is putting it all in a database. You heard a wonderful session about oligometastasis yesterday, and we heard a whole uh, 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 clinically driven uh, uh, decision-making process about whether you should go after oligometastasis or not. There's virtually no genomic data of understanding whether those oligometastasis are those that can be cured or those that can't. Ben Calvo uh, and I are working actually on a signature uh, on, uh, on hepatic METs that we think may help us with that, but that's what, what needs to be. And with the possible exception of hepatic METs, there's no one institution, no matter how big, that will be able to solve this problem because these are, uh, th these are not that common. So it's crucial that databases be developed at institutions like ours, like Duke, like Wake Forest, and the next phase, it's crucial that that data be shared because that's the only way. We're not going to do 1,000 patient clinical trials of oligometastasis for colon cancer in the brain, but we may be able to collect a thousand cases and the follow-up if, you know, 20 of the biggest cancer centers actually record that data. So it's imperative that we start doing this, it's imperative that we have the databases, and it's imperative that we share this information. This is what uh, we are so far, we're a little bit over 100 patients. Uh, Matt Ewan, who you meet yesterday, who met yesterday, and, and Jing Wu, who's uh, in the background, have been particularly good about um, um, consenting patients and, uh, and grabbing tissue. But this is the phase where we're we're trying to work things through. And now I think we're uh, we've opened a new lab and we're we're we're, we're ready to move. Uh, the experience with the first 50 patients, we found some non-canonical. EGF receptor mutations uh, in, in people, those that haven't, that they've been seen before, but they haven't been known to w w whether they respond to EGF receptor inhibitors. So we're, we're doing some cell biology on that. 
we found misdiagnosis. Um, someone that was said to have met, um, you know, metastatic me um, melanoma got some good news that it was a benign familial tumor. There's a whole lot of uh, complex genetic changes when you uh, take patients that have been treated uh, with, with, uh, with cytotoxics. And we've seen, uh, and you saw some of those yesterday in, in Sturgis' talk, that there are many uh, alterations that we, we have seen already. Uh, perhaps up to 30 percent of the patients that we're sequencing, you're finding something that you didn't know that may eventually be clinically applicable. So this is an exciting time. Uh, for us and, and our faculty, as I said, it really involves so many people. It's really being uh, led by Neil Hayes in particular, uh, Ned Sharpless, Chuck Peru, Katie Hoadley, Joel Parker, June Co., uh, Grilly Olson, Claire Dees, just so many people. I, I won't go any further than the list because there are about 40 people uh, involved in it. And that's, that's what's the exciting part about it, really combining technology. Uh, and moving forward. The, the problems are you know, how do you pay for VIR? How do we access metastatic tissue? Uh, and we need to keep it all in the database, as I've said before. So I'm going to stop there, and hopefully that gave you a, an overview of the kinds of things that I think we can do to try to understand how all these mutations, which can be confusing, track into systems that let us know the vulnerability of cancers, how we can figure out combinations of drugs that can hit a vulnerability, probably with chemotherapy. I don't think we're going to get rid of chemotherapy anytime soon. Um, and how, can we put those two together? Can we move it up front? Can we destroy really most of the tumor? And then Sturgio said yesterday, can we bring the immune system in to help us mop up? So thanks very much. Great conference.